voice of freedom. You're listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. This is the Hour of the Time, and I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're going to hear two hours of lecture that I did on August the 23rd at the annual Intelligence Service CAGI conference, which was held in Norman, Oklahoma, and that was the last day of the conference and uh, that night we uh, did our camp out which lasted all night it was a fantastic camp out um, this two hours I don't know exactly which part of the day uh, that it was uh, conducted uh, within and it doesn't matter what matters is the content itself I suggest that you have pen and paper by your side and that you take copious notes and remember that this is only two hours out of over 40 total hours of lecture by many people other than myself. And the only reason that you're getting lectures by me is because I really don't have permission from the other speakers to air their lectures on the radio. But I have my permission. <laughs> and I have one other person's permission, two hours of, or one hour of which you've already heard. If you have a satellite and we're listening to the post-broadcast on satellite only, actually during the conference. So pay attention tonight, ladies and gentlemen. This is, well, it won't be a full two hours, but it's almost two hours long. Remember, the hour of the time is brought to you by Swiss America Trading. And I'm going to give you this conference, this, uh, this conference, this commercial um, word up front and possibly another one at the end so that it does not have to be interrupted in the middle except to turn over tapes. And um, I want you to call Swiss America Trading. I want you to call Swiss America Trading and thank them for sponsoring this broadcast and for backing the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, the voice of freedom throughout the world, the only voice left, I might add. And that uh, warrants them a big, warm thank you and your friendship. So call, ask for the latest newsletter, tell them that you're a steady listener to the hour of the time. Make sure that you thank them profusely for sponsoring this broadcast. Ask them how you can get your hands on some real money. When you call, ask for Frank, because he devotes so much of his time to this broadcast. If he's not available, then talk to anybody else who's there. They all really care, folks. And remember... Today was Craig Smith's wedding anniversary. I hope you all sent a little card or something and uh, made him feel a little bit special, he and his wife today, from uh, all of the folks who do business with him and, and, of course, who listen to the hour of the time in the Freedom Radio Network. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-BUY-COIN. 1-800-BUY-COIN. 1-800-289-2646. Ladies and gentlemen, do it now. You know how you are. This sacred ground Deserves my fall no let's for God for freedom call and if my life be laid down let it be on sacred ground so if we 
just like you who are stepping outside the bounds of their authority. You know why? Because they get monetary rewards by destroying you. There's a legal system of bribery and rewards and awards set up that pay these people above and beyond their salary for every prosecution and recovery of money from you that they can get, including judges. You know why you can't win when you step into a tax court? Because if the judge convicts you, he gets $25,000 into his personal bank account immediately. How many of you knew that? It's true. How many of you knew that there are people across this country that you trust to prepare your tax forms who are ratting on you for rewards? CPAs. Tax attorneys. What's the biggie? Everybody goes to H&R Block is a creation of the Internal Revenue Code to catch tax cheaters who don't even have to file tax and pay it in the first place. Your neighbor, if he turns you in and the tax is recovered, gets a percentage of every penny that's recovered. A lot of you think you're so cool telling your neighbor, ah. You know, I really owed 40000 but I only paid twenty. He runs back home, called the IRS. Hey, guess what? My neighbor just told me they really owed 40000 but they only paid twenty. Now, if you get the other 20000 how much do I get? 
proof. It's true. It's true. Why in the world would you ever tell your neighbor in the first place? And believe me, you think you're cool. Cheating the IRS out of a few dollars when you don't owe them anything in the first place? You're not cool, you're a fool. <laughs> and you're advertising the fact. I filed my income tax return, but I cheated them, you know, I showed them. <laughs> oh man, am I cool. Not so, McGee. Not cool at all. It's sheeple. Learn who you are. Learn the law. Learn the truth. Stand up, draw a line in the sand, and claim your sovereignty. Claim it. Remember the first rule in common law. What's the first principle in common law? He who does not claim a right does not have that right. When a right is challenged, he who does not defend that right loses that right. That's the entire basic building block of the law. So, I not only claim it, I defend it, and I'm willing to die for it. I'm the most dangerous person in the world. There's nothing more dangerous than somebody who's willing to die for what they believe in. But I would never hurt anybody that doesn't threaten me. Never, not in a million years. Okay. <clears throat> I know a lot of people who say, I wouldn't read that, it's a communist newspaper. You wouldn't catch me reading anything the CFR puts out. That's our enemy. How many of you have been actually fought combat in a war? You might raise your hand. I mean, it's not a cool thing, but we know something that nobody else knows, right, Dub? We know if you go out to face an enemy you don't know anything about, you're liable to get killed. If you don't know how they operate, if you don't know what the tactics are, if you don't know the kind of weapons you're liable to encounter, if you don't know who they are, what they believe in, and what they're fighting for, you're liable to get killed real quick. Any general, any fighting man who steps on a battlefield who doesn't understand the nature and the capabilities and the equipment of the enemy and their tactics is doomed to defeat. You must know your enemy. If you don't read what the enemy writes or what they say, if you don't read their statements of policy or their intention, if you don't listen to their speeches, you can't fight them. You don't even know what you're fighting. You don't even know who the enemy is, do you? Until you started listening to my broadcast, many people in here knew something was wrong, but they never had the slightest idea who was doing it or why. And I didn't either until I started studying these people and reading what they're about. And they make it no secret. They just flat come right out and say, hey, we're engaged in the process of destroying you for the good of all humanity. Because <laughs> we're cool. You can write to the Council of Foreign Relations and subscribe to their publication called, appropriately, Foreign Relations. In here, it tells you everything that's going to happen in the coming months and years. In here, this one, it says, Workers in the world economy. The world may be moving inexorably toward one of those tragic moments that will lead historians to ask why nothing was done in time. <laughs> Maybe is their polite way of saying this is what's absolutely going to happen. What's printed in here is set in stone. China after Ding. Dealing with Russia. Ukraine struggle. A new trade summit for an Atlantic Union. Clinton's Irish surprise. The myth of post-Cold War chaos. 
It is a myth. They're totally in control. It's not chaotic to them, just us. You want to know what the communists are doing? You've got to read the communist press. You want to know what they think? You've got to read their writings. You've got to read Lenin, Trotsky, Khrushchev, Stalin. You've got to read them to know what they're doing and who they are and what they want, what their plans are. You'd be amazed. They set out what is happening today decades ago. And if you'd read it, you would have known it long before it happened. When I make these predictions on the radio and in my writings are in Veritas, do you really think that I get out a crystal ball and just sort of... Ah, <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> I got it. No. I read and read some more and read some more and listen and read and read some more and study and put it down and make notes and assemble puzzles. And pretty soon I'm looking at the puzzle and I don't have the piece in my hand. It just materializes in front of my eyes and I know the future. With 100% accuracy in most cases. And it's not because I'm more intelligent. It's not because I'm any wizard. God doesn't whisper in my ear. It's because they told me. They can tell you too. You too. Can be a prophet in your own time. But don't ever make the mistake of believing that you're really a prophet. That's Brother Stairsville. I call it the stairway to the sewer. <coughs> okay? Now, we got that out of the way. And everybody knows that the dice is loaded. What they don't know is I got the dice. My dice. It can be your dice or it can be their dice. Which would you rather it be? That's right. If you're going to play in a game where the dice is loaded, you want the loaded dice to be your dice, right? Not theirs. You want to win, not lose. Don't believe the bullshit that they told you in high school. It's not winning that counts. It's how you play the game. That's right, bullshit. When's the last time you saw the crowd rush down onto the field and carry the losing team off? <laughs> Pouring champagne on their head. Anybody ever seen that in America? No, and you never will, unless you're a Democrat. <laughs> okay? No. Winning is everything. Don't ever believe all that other crap. If you're not a winner, what are you? You're a loser. You want to be a loser? No. In this country, there's only one thing that has ever counted since the beginning. Winners. 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 And more winners. Who made this country? Winners, not losers. They convinced everybody now that they should be losers, and that's why this country is regressing, going down the tubes. Because it's becoming, instead of a country of winners, a country of losers. Followers. Sheep, I love that cartoon over there. All these sheep are standing around in this bar, in this lounge. These two sheep are sitting at the bar, and the guy says, Oh, well, I guess I really am a follower. <laughs> I don't know what he thought he was before he entered that argument. By the way, that's my personal CompuServe account. You have a computer and you want to communicate with me right there. <coughs> Now, if you do a lot of traveling like I do, and you need to be able to have access to the Internet to do research, to communicate, uh, to do work, for instance, wherever I'm at, I can work on Veritas. It is important if you travel and you do a lot of work, you need access to communicate and to, for research material, 
and you're working on publications or articles or original material, you need to have a notebook computer. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if some of you don't want to go to the hassle of building a big home computer, let me show you something <laughs> that will blow your mind. Not too long ago, the only way that you could have a powerful computer was by doing what I've already given you. That was the only way. And they're big and bulky and you could only put them in one spot and leave them there. This will do more than everything that I told you a while ago. This is a Pentium 133 megabytes with a 2 gigabyte hard drive, a 6x CD ROM drive. It's got 32 megabytes of memory. It's got a 12.1 inch color SVGA screen. In other words, this, what I'm holding in my hand, is more powerful than if you took my instructions a while ago and built your own computer. It's going to be. The difference between this and what you can build and put in your house is I can take this with me anywhere. I can plug it into any phone line. I have instant communications with anybody. I can do research. I can access databases. I can produce Veritas, the entire newspaper, on this notebook computer. You know how much this costs? Take a guess. Let's hear some guesses. Hold up your hand if you have a guess. Yes. No? No? But well, that's close. Yes? No? Let me tell you, six months ago, this you couldn't even buy. In the whole world, you couldn't buy it. Six months ago, it didn't exist. That's how fast technology is changing. This didn't exist. You couldn't have it. If you had a million dollars, you could not touch this six months ago. Five months ago, if you wanted this, it would have cost you close to ten grand. I purchased this for three thousand four hundred and eighty dollars. Isn't that neat? If you can afford it, get one. Because if you have this, you don't need all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> don't need any of it. You can get this if you can afford it. You can plug a printer and a scanner into it. You can even, even get a docking station for this. It just costs a few hundred dollars. You can leave the docking station at home with your printer and your scanner attached. And when you come home, back here, see this little panel here? This little panel conceals the plug-in module for the docking station. In other words, I come home, I do this. I don't even have to open this. I just plug this in. This has a little catch here that catches in the docking station, opens it up, plugs it in. I now have a home computer with a monitor, 17-inch, a laser printer, and a scanner. When I want to go somewhere, I push a button, pull this out, I'm gone. The hard disk drive is removable. If this 2 gigabyte drive fills up, I pull it out, slide in another one. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Pardon? No, there's one battery. The battery's right here. No, nope, not kidding you at all. There's the battery. That's it. it. Takes two hours to charge it. Full charge, two hours. Isn't that amazing? This is Stager, S A G E R. Yeah, it has an AC adapter. It's the 86 MP8600. It is a fantastic piece of equipment. Now, you don't have to get this. I'm showing you this because I know that some of you can't afford it and need it. Others of you may never need anything like this. This is not a show-off thing. It's not a yuppie thing. It's not something you buy. Uh, to, to be a big person or whatever is something you buy if you need it. I need it. If you need it, it's available. And this is all you'll ever need if you can afford to get it. It doesn't matter how much faster chips get at this point because a 133 megahertz chip is faster than anything I really need. 
it does the job for me. I don't have to sit and wait for a long time for graphics to load. I mean, I hit the mouse, bam, it's there. I got 32 megabyte of RAM in there. It's wonderful. And it and all the accessories and disk drives and everything else can be carried in this small little cargo case, which is well padded so that if anybody smacks this, it won't hurt that computer. It just looks like a regular carry-on bag. Nobody knows what I got in here. It could be a bag of dirty socks. Don't ever buy a bag for your portable computer that says notebook. <laughs> Our portable computer. Our laptop. Because the minute you set it down, it's gone. So these are high theft items. Okay? Now, I can also bring things with me when I go somewhere. Because I have to give a speech. If I can find it. There it is, and it's in my word processing program, because that's what I programmed it to do. I'm just going to save what I was working on the other day. Okay, pay attention to this, this is very important. You need to know this. There's been a lot of discussion recently in some quarters concerning the necessity for the federal judiciary to be completely independent of the government. Certainly this was the intention of the Founding Fathers, although some of them expressed grave doubts as to whether or not this was possible. Recently, in the Arizona Republic, the paper's editorial staff took the liberty of quoting United States Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist, who stated that judicial independence is, quote, one of the crown jewels of our system of government, end quote. Rehnquist was also quoted as saying that judges, while not above criticism, should never be threatened with removal because of their rulings because, quote, integrity requires independence, end quote. We would agree with Chief Justice Rehnquist. That integrity requires independence. However, we also state that the converse is true. That lack of independence, especially where large sums of money are concerned, can throw the integrity of the federal judiciary into serious question. Would you agree with that? Have you ever wondered why some federal judges rule the way they do on certain issues? Does it often seem as if some Members of federal judiciary utterly dismiss many arguments which plaintiffs bring into court, arguments based solely on statutes, when these arguments contradict the government's unsupported assertions. Do you agree with that? Do you wonder about that? 
Does it often seem as if some federal judges permit federal employees to behave in lax, even unlawful ways without sanctions? Have you found that to be true? Finally, does it often seem that many members of the federal judiciary, particularly U.S. District Court judges, often rule inexplicably and apparently arbitrarily in favor of government? Of course. I'm going to present a premise grounded in statute that the federal judiciary is not at all as independent as Chief Justice Rehnquist claims it to be. Indeed, we believe that the allegedly independent federal judiciary has the capacity, because of the statutes which I am about to reveal, to be as corrupt and as influenced by money as is any organized mob. There can be no independence or integrity in a system which permits what essentially appears to be lawful, one-sided bribery. Recently, there was a case in Wyoming in which the Bighorn County Assessor, Mrs. Jackie Payne, received an IRS summons to turn over records relevant to a citizen living in Bighorn County. Mrs. Payne took it upon herself to familiarize herself with both federal and state statutes regarding IRS summonses and records. She then submitted a declaration to the IRS in which she cited specifically the numerous statutes which caused her to be not subject to the summons, including the fact that she, as county assessor, was not defined on the summons as a third-party record keeper. She also informed IRS and Wyoming state officials of the fact that were she to turn over the summoned records, she would be breaking Wyoming state law. Mrs. Payne provided an argument for her position based solely on statute and supporting case authority. IRS decided to press the issue, and she eventually wound up in U.S. District Court before Judge Clarence Brimmer. Before he even heard the arguments presented in this case, Judge Brimmer made a public statement to the press that, quote, she cannot be allowed to win, end quote. Can you imagine that? A strange pronouncement indeed from a public official whose job is ostensibly to be impartial, <laughs> to hear the facts of a case before rendering an opinion, and who is supposed to judge a case solely on its statutory merits. She cannot be allowed to win. Judge Bremer, upon hearing Mrs. Payne's case, then summarily dismissed her statutory cites as tax protester arguments, which fact is strange since Mrs. Payne's arguments were based solely on specific statutes and internal revenue manuals, and she was not a tax protester. A tax protester's records had been summoned through her because she was the keeper of those records in the county. So one might reasonably ask specifically which of the statutes and internal revenue manual sections are tax protester material. Why, someone might ask, would a federal judge who is supposed to be impartial make statements that would have been more appropriately made by a prosecutor? Perhaps the federal judiciary is not quite so independent as we might think or hope it to be. How can it be when the law permits the federal government to privately award judges up to $25,000 in undisclosed cash awards and further to privately, erroneously overpay them up to $10,000 and then privately waive the overpayments as rewards from the government for conviction of cases that the government prosecutes? Although the statement I just made is incredible. I will support it with specific statutory sites. Then you can draw your own conclusions. So let's begin with an analogy. Two people, whom we'll call Mr. White and Mr. Brown, agree to a business arrangement. Mr. White, who produces a certain kind of widget, agrees to sell 100 of these widgets to Mr. Brown. 
In the agreement, Mr. White promises Mr. Brown that the widgets will perform a certain function. After the sale, Mr. Brown discovers that the widgets do not perform the requisite function. Mr. Brown angrily tells Mr. White that the widgets have failed to perform as advertised. He then threatens to sue Mr. White if he does not make good on the deal. Now, it's clear that the two men cannot reach an agreement. A lawsuit is imminent. Mr. White then suggests to Mr. Brown that instead of going to court, they go to arbitration. Mr. Brown agrees. But there is one simple thing that Mr. White has neglected to mention in the state in which both men live. A statute exists that permits only Mr. White to offer the arbiter a cash award. Since Mr. White owns the arbitration company, and furthermore, another statute exists that Mr. White's arbitration company is the only arbitration company lawfully permitted to do business in this state. However, still another statute exists that states that should Mr. Brown or anyone other than Mr. White attempt to offer the arbiter a cash award, in effect a bribe, he will have committed a felony. Does this scenario sound fair? No. Does the arbiter have independence? No. Is the arbiter encouraged by this setup to have integrity? No. What are the chances of the arbiters making a truly fair ruling or that Mr. Brown will receive a fair trial or even win? Zilch, zip, zero. He lost before he started. Now, folks, as ridiculous as this scenario sounds, the potential for this same setup exists in statue for the federal judiciary, and I'm going to attempt to leads you through the maze of federal statutes which when added together provides ample evidence that the strong potential for one-sided bribery exists in statute from the federal government to its employees U.S. district court judges If you're never going to use graphics or video or anything like that, get any video board you can buy with one megabyte because you don't really care. Because if you're just using a word processor, you don't. So let us start with Title V of the United States Code, Government Organization and Employees, Part 3, Employees, Subpart C, Employee Performance, Chapter 45, Incentive Awards, Subchapter 1, Awards for Superior Accomplishments, Section 4502. This section of Title V reveals that government employees can receive cash awards from their employer of up to $25,000. Small a. Except as provided by subsection small b of this section, a cash award under this subchapter, 5 U.S.C.S., subsection 4501, at sec, may not exceed $10,000. Small b. When the head of an agency certifies to the Office of Personnel Management that the suggestion, invention, superior accomplishment, or other meritorious effort for which the award is proposed is highly exceptional and unusually outstanding, a cash award in excess of $10,000, but not in excess of $25,000, may be granted with the approval of the office. Small c. A cash award under this subchapter, 5 U.S.C.S., subsection 4501, at sec, is in addition to the regular pay of the recipient. Acceptance of a cash award under this subchapter, 5 U.S.C.S., subsection 4501 at sec, constitutes an agreement that the use by the government of an idea, method, or device for which the award is made does not form the basis of a further claim of any nature against the government by the employee as heirs or assigns. Small d. A cash award to an expense for the honorary recognition of an employee may be paid from the fund or appropriation available to the activity primarily benefiting or the various activities benefiting. The head of the agency concerned determines the amount to be paid by each activity for an agency award under Section 4503 of this title. The President determines the amount to be paid by each activity for a Presidential Award under Sections 4504 of this title. See, the President can pay people off, too. 
small e. The Office of Personnel Management may be may by regulation permit agencies to grant employees time off from duty without loss of pay or charge to leave as an award in recognition of superior accomplishment or other personal effort that contributes to the quality, efficiency, or economy of government operations. Recovering money that they say you owe that you haven't paid contributes to the efficiency and economy of government, doesn't it? Obviously, the wording of the preceding statute is somewhat difficult to follow, but careful reading and rereading of it plainly shows that the government has built into its statutes the payments to its employees of what are called cash awards and has set up the conditions under which these payments are made. From 5 U.S.C., we now go to 28 United States Code, known as Judiciary and Judicial Procedure. Title 28 at Section 602, Employees, States. Small a. The director shall appoint and fix the compensation of necessary employees of the administrative office in accordance with the Administrative Office of the United States Courts Personnel Act of 1990. Subsection A of 28 United States Code, Section 602, seems fairly innocuous, doesn't it? But what exactly is the Administrative Office of the United States Courts Personnel Act of 1990? See, most people would never even go look. Not me. I want to know. Because I am curious. Well, it's Section 3, small a, 1 of the Act, it's stated that the Act establishes procedures for employee evaluations, the granting of periodic pay adjustments, and incentive awards. Wow. We're on the hot trail, aren't we? This dude's walking along, dripping maple syrup. And we're looking for the pancakes. <coughs> So who are these employees that may be granted incentive awards of up to $25,000? That's the next question. Who are these employees? According to 5 U.S.C., 5 U.S.C., Section 3371.3, the Administrative Office of the United States Courts is defined as a federal agency. 5 U.S.C. Section 7342 reveals that the Administrative Office of the United States Courts is the employing agency for federal judges. Wow. 7342. 5 CFR Section 870.103 reveals that the Administrative Office of the United States Courts is the employing office for judges of all United States Courts of Appeals, all United States District Courts, the Court of International Trade, the Claims Court, and the District Courts in Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the Virgin Islands. So the law states that these specific categories of federal judges can receive cash awards of up to $25,000. Pancakes! We got pancakes. But isn't there some law, folks, that requires federal judges to disclose all of the money that they receive and whatever sources from which they receive it? Wouldn't you think such a critical position would demand such a revelation? Guess what? No such requirement. Anywhere. The Ethics in Government Act, 5 United States Code, approximately subsection 101 at set at 102, specifically forbids, specifically forbids disclosure of monies earned from the federal government. <laughs> the Ethics in Government Act exists ostensibly only to discourage conflicts of interest between private industry and government employees between private individuals and government employees, between foreign entities and government employees. However, the Ethics in Government Act ironically fails to protect the general public from any knowledge of graft, corruption, or bribery within the federal government itself. Very convenient, isn't it? Furthermore, 
Personal financial information is exempt from disclosure under the Privacy Act. Federal judges can thus be paid off completely privately and secretly and lawfully by their employer, the federal government, with a payment statutorily dubbed, in this case, an incentive award, also referred to as a cash award. In the case of a private individual, if he or she tried to offer a federal judge a secret incentive award or a cash award, it would be called a bribe. The attempt of a private individual to bribe a judge is classified by the government as a felony. Interesting, isn't it? But what about the Inspector General, whose job is defined in Title V as being to conduct and supervise audits and investigations relating to the programs and operations of establishments relevant to federal government employees and also to prevent and detect fraud and abuse in such programs and operations? Can't he determine whether or not federal judges are being paid off with cash awards from the government or bribes from private individuals? The Inspector General Act of 1978 by the United States Code, approximately Section 8D, reveals that the Inspector General is, quote, under the authority and direction and control of the Secretary of the Treasury with respect to audits or investigations concerning large E, other matters, the disclosure of which would constitute a serious threat to national security. Section 8D further states, the Secretary of the Treasury may prohibit the Inspector General from carrying out or completing any audit or investigation or from issuing any subpoena after such Inspector General has decided to initiate, carry out, or complete such audit or investigation or to issue such subpoena if the Secretary determines that such prohibition is necessary to prevent the disclosure of any information described under paragraph 1 or to prevent significant impairment to the national interests of the United States. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Section 80 reads exactly the same, except for the substitution of the term Attorney General. How about that? Reads exactly the same, except for the substitution of the term Attorney General for the term Secretary of the Treasury. Perhaps it would be an impairment to the national interests of the United States to permit the Inspector General to audit the federal judiciary. And remember, the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Treasury are both appointed to office by the President and both have the authority to prevent the audit of whomever or whatever they choose, including the accounts of federal judges. Boy, aren't they slick? Get around these guys, boy, you're going to be falling down all the time. This I see you. Other government agencies are also permitted to award money to federal judges. Did you know that? Other agencies are also permitted to award money to federal judges. The Internal Revenue Service Handbook of Delegation Orders 1229-91 reveals that the Internal Revenue Service is permitted to pay cash monetary awards to employees of, quote, other government agencies, end quote, which includes federal judges. Now these sites would seem to provide enough information to support our contention, folks, that federal judges receive cash awards, also known as bribes, from their employer, the United States. But let's go still further. We have evidence that there is in place in the statutes yet another form of bribery called, quote, erroneous payment, end quote, and, quote, waiver, end quote. So let us examine portions of the Code of Federal Regulations, 4 CFR, the regulations relevant to 4 United States Code, flag and seal, seat of government, and the state, section 91.4, states the following. Quote, the director of the administrative office of the United States courts may grant a waiver in whole or in part of a claim of the United States in an amount aggregating not more than $10,000 arising out of an erroneous payment of pay. 4 CFR section 91.5, small a, 2, quote, 
All doubts are to be resolved in favor of the applicant, end quote, read judge. 4 CFR section 91.6 small b, quote, an erroneous payment, the collection of which is waived pursuant to the subchapter is deemed valid payment for all purposes, end quote. So not only can they give out $25,000 cash awards all over the place every three minutes for different things, they can also overpay them by as much as $10,000 and then waive the overpayment. Wouldn't you like to have an employer like that? <clears throat> Again, not only judges are permitted these overpayments and waivers. 28 CFR, section 0 0.155, reveals that employees of the Department of Justice in effect, FBI agents and United States attorneys are permitted the same waivers. 28 CFR section 0 0.143 reveals that Department of Justice employees are eligible for incentive awards. 28 CFR section 0 0.11 reveals that Department of Justice employees are eligible for incentive awards for, quote, personal effort which contributes to the efficiency, economy, or other improvements of government operations, end quote. So what op what actions, folks, might constitute a contribution to the efficiency, economy, or other improvement of government operations? Well, how about the seizure and forfeiture of private property by government agencies? That certainly adds millions of dollars every year to the government's coffers, doesn't it? Might those responsible for such actions possibly receive Incentive awards from the government? I can guarantee you they do. The U.S. attorneys who have prosecuted the citizens who have been forced to forfeit their houses in IRS, IRS seizures have certainly contributed to the economy and efficiency of government operations of the federal government. Do you ever wonder why the highest salary that an IRS agent can be paid is like $28,000 and the guy lives in a $200,000 house? Didn't you get curious about that? Didn't you wonder how a judge making $75,000 a year lives in a million dollar house? A judge? 75 grand a year? Where do you get this million dollar house at? Where do you get this Lamborghini and this, this Mercedes Benz and those two horses that his daughter rides on his private bridal path every day? Oh, Judge Jones is a pillar of the community. He's as crooked. He's as crooked as the night is long. <clears throat> Federal judges who have sanctioned these same seizures have also certainly contributed to the economy and efficiency of government operations. Both U.S. attorneys and judges have placed millions of dollars of seized properties into auctions, the profits of which go straight to the federal government. Never mind the havoc and personal lives wrought by the seizure and sale of property by the government. Never mind the, the suicides and the broken families, the lost dreams. Millions of dollars of seized properties into auctions. The profits of which go straight to the federal government. My power saving feature just shut me off here. This is a good feature. Just shut me off again, which means the battery is low. Yep. So I plug it in. I get a uh, plug right back here. I think it'll reach. All I can do is get it out and plug it in. So I've been using this battery the whole time I've been here without recharging it. It might reach. It will reach. <clears throat> 
a fantastic feature of this computer, too. When the battery gets low, it automatically saves what you're working on so you don't lose anything, and it shuts off the computer. And then when you come back, all your stuff is right there, ready to go. Don't lose a thing. It's amazing. Pardon? I know. A lot of people make the mistake of working on a document. They'll be working for hours. They have hours of work into this document. All of a sudden, they have a power failure, and they haven't saved anything, and it's all gone instantly. So about every 10 minutes while you're working on anything, save your work, always. Because you have no control over the power company. And if that power fails, you're history. Oh, I know here. Keep trying to boot on the uh, on a non-bootable disk here. <coughs> bought a spare, which I should do, I will do, so I don't really know what they are. There's no power to this, that's what's in there. There's no power to this. I need an extension cord. There's no power to that plug. Oh, good. Weirdest. When I raise my arm to the square, <laughs> call me Poobah Snake Oil. Don't I look good? Have I just had my little apron? <laughs> and my little Masonic pinky ring? Look at Gay. She has the most incredible look on her face. <laughs> I don't like it either. Take a picture and send it to Bobo. <laughs> yeah, he'll probably come and try to steal his hat back. Want to what? Yeah. Take a look. That's the 32nd degree. Scotty's right. Whoops. Yes, sir. What? Okay. Let's take a break. Take a break. If you're supposed to check out, check out. Hello, everybody. I hope you've all checked out or in or up or down or whatever. You've all been checked. You've all been checked, but have you been dusted? Nobody's been dusted? No. Nice. Okay, guys, <clears throat> I'm going to continue this, and then we're going to watch a little videotape. Both United States attorneys and judges have placed millions of dollars of seized properties into auctions, the profit of which goes straight to the federal government, never mind the havoc. 
personal lives robbed by the seizure and sale of property by the government. Havoc is an understatement for what it does to people. It destroys them, literally. Government operations of this nature are both efficient and economical, at least as far as the coffers of the federal government is concerned. And the U.S. attorneys and the federal judges are by law entitled to cash awards for the contributions to this efficiency and economy. Knowing this, it should come as no surprise that the U.S. attorneys and federal judges usually have their offices located in the same building, sometimes on the same hall. But isn't there some sort of rule that prevents a presiding judge from hearing a case in which he has an interest in the subject matter? <laughs> Somebody giving give me my uh, thermostat tampering seeking missile. <laughs> Women and thermostats, there's just something about that relationship that's really weird. They have to keep going back and making contact. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> In fact, there is such a law, ladies and gentlemen. 28 United States Code, Section 455, small b, 4, reveals that a judge should disqualify himself if he has a financial interest in the proceedings. However, we must examine what is actually meant by the term financial interest. <laughs> Would you believe they got their own definition for this? <laughs> 28 U.S.C., Section 455, small d. This is going to blow your mind. <laughs> Four, financial interest means ownership of a legal or equitable interest, however small, or a relationship as director, advisor, or other active participant in the affairs of a party, except that, except that, small one, ownership in a mutual or common investment fund that holds securities is not a financial interest in such securities unless the judge participates in the management of the fund. <laughs> Two, an office in an educational, religious, charitable, fraternal, or civic organization is not a financial interest in securities held by the organization. Three, the property interest of a, the proprietary interest of a policyholder in a mutual insurance company of a depositor in a mutual savings association or a similar proprietary interest is a financial interest in the organization only if the outcome of the proceeding could substantially affect the value of the interest. Does anybody know what I just said? <laughs> For ownership of government securities is a financial interest in the issuer only if the outcome of the proceeding could substantially affect the value of the securities. So the cash awards statutorily awarded to judges do not technically constitute a financial interest within the meaning of the term defined. Because it doesn't cover bribes by the federal government. What we are therefore left with, folks, is this. We private citizens must rely solely upon the integrity of federal judges and others who are eligible for the substantial and privately awarded cash awards. The following list is that of numerous court cases in which judges and other employees and agents of the federal government were convicted of crimes which clearly proved them to be without integrity. Slade versus United States, 85 F. 2nd, 786, 10th Circuit Court, 1936. Judge bribed the juror to acquit a defendant. The judge was convicted of bribery. United States versus Manton, 107 F. 2nd, 834, 2nd Circuit, 1939. Court of Appeals judge was involved in bribes to influence decisions. McDonald versus Alabama, 57 Alabama. Appeals, 529, 329. Sex for leniency.
sex for leniency? What's that? I'd call it a horny judge, is what I. <laughs> United States versus Campbell, 684 F. 2nd, 141, D.C., 1982. Traffic tickets, judge and gratuity. United States versus Murphy, 768 F. 2nd, 1518, 7th Circuit, 1985. Graylord, F. United States versus Holloway, 778, F, 2nd, 653, 11th Circuit, 1985. Two mobile state court judges. United States versus Lefevre. United States versus Claiborne. State Bar of Nevada versus Claiborne. United States versus Nixon. U.S. District Judge Convicted of Bribery. And blah, 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 blah. It just goes on and 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 on. Pre-trial appeal and later I'll see one criminal case is now a member of Congress. <laughs> bribe, 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 bribe. Former IRS Commissioner Convicted of Tax Evasion. <laughs> bribe, 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 IRS agent and bribes, agents and bribes, agents and bribes, FBI agent and bribes, FBI agent giving documents to Soviets, a USA convicted of taking gratuities, a USA bribes, customs agents killed for $700,000, crooked IRS agent, IRS agent guilty of defrauding by filing false returns, IRS agent bribe, homosexual IRS agent indicted. Blah, 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 blah. Prosecutor Elizabeth Trimble and special agents fabricated evidence and the case was dismissed. Blah, 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 blah. On and on and on and on and on and on. Several megabytes. I could stand here and do this all day. None of the bribery charges cited in any of those that I just gave you, and I didn't read all of them to you, didn't even come close, didn't even make a dent. None of them reflects any prosecutions or convictions for the ubiquitous incentive award or overpayments which I have revealed to you. Since these cash awards are lawful bribes and therefore can never be prosecuted as crimes while the statutes permitting them are enforced. We believe that the citizens of these United States of the American Union can never truly be free unless and until the federal judiciary is completely free from the possibility of government-sponsored graft and corruption or corruption of any type. We believe that Congress needs to be apprised of the facts in this article, knowing full well that they will probably completely ignore them, and that it needs to write laws which permit the citizens to closely scrutinize the monies which federal judges receive from their employer, the government, especially in cases in which the citizen's property or freedom is at stake. But that's never going to happen. Until this happens, we believe that as private citizens, we shall be at the disadvantage of the awards which the federal government may bestow undisclosed upon federal judges, judges who are supposed to be impartial and to ensure us all a fair trial. Because there is no provision of law for disclosure of financial information on judges and because there is no Privacy Act system of records which purports to maintain records on financial affairs relevant to federal judges, we have no proof whatsoever that any federal judge has ever received any of the incentive awards, overpayments, or waivers described in this speech. We have written this speech simply to reveal the evidence published in statutes that there exists an enormous potential for what is essentially government-sanctioned bribery of judges by the federal government itself, and that there is no way for the public to know whether or not such bribes are being paid. We believe that not all judges know about this information, nor would all judges accept such bribes were they offered. This was written by two dear friends, Mark and Tina Terry. Who contributed quite a bit of research to the intelligence service. What do you think? Did you all know that? Didn't know it, did you? No. You know how 
to get around these things, you should always challenge everything. Challenge jurisdiction, challenge the judge. One of the challenges to the judge is, have you ever accepted any incentive award or award for achievement or conviction of any case which has appeared before you, Your Honor? Yeah, always say for the record. Chances are he will then get up and leave. And another judge will come in to whom you ask the same question. And many others, by the way. It's just one of many that you ask of the judge. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the fraternal order of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction of Freemasonry? Are of the Northern Jurisdiction of Freemasonry? Are of the York Rite? Are of any other fraternal organization whatsoever, regardless of name, purpose, our place of origin. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Not another one comes in. They can't hold you in contempt. You have the right to ask those questions. You're not insulting the judge. You're not in contempt of court. No, you don't say, Mr. Honor. What, um, what, you, what you say is this. I have a right under the law and quote the exact law to challenge the judge in this court if I believe that his membership in these organizations would be detrimental to the judgment of this case. For instance, Your Honor, the people prosecuting me are Freemasons. I have before me the oath of the Royal Ark Degree, which specifically states that you must side with any other brother of the Lodge if you are a Freemason. Therefore, you must rule with him. And this is for the record, Your Honor. If you wish to hold me in contempt of court, Your Honor, please do so on the record so that I may challenge your ruling in the Court of Appeals. <coughs> Excuse me? <laughs> and another one will come in. And when they've gone through all their judges, your case will just mysteriously disappear from the docket. Unless they can find a judge who doesn't fit all of those things. Okay? Isn't that fun? <laughs> Tell you the truth, it's not fun. It's challenging. And you have to be on your toes and you have to know what you're doing every instant. And there's always the danger you could go to jail at any second. Is it worth it? You bet your boots it is. Even if you do go to jail for the rest of your life, it's worth it. It's worth it. And if everybody would do it, it would very quickly end the tyranny. inconsistent because judges are trying judges. Sometimes they're forced to do what has to be done and other times they're not. Depends on how much public and political pressure is put on that judge to do the right thing. If there's not a tremendous amount put upon them, they're not going to convict another judge. They're brothers in the same lodge. Down the street, the temple without windows, they all go there. You can go down and take videotape of them all going in and out every day. <laughs> and eventually, if you collect your videotapes and file them, you'll have on videotape every important person in your city going in and out of that lodge because that's how rules America right now. They, we're in control of a snake that's got a tail as long as you can imagine. Subversives.
Okay, now we're going to watch a videotape, and it's going to take exactly one hour and ten minutes. How about that? Right? Boy. Oh. See? This is very good. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may not have, but it will... Pardon? Two videotapes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes, the Shadow of the Tempers and Secrets. Listen carefully to this, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go to the end of this tape. You will not be able to hear all of the second uh, video, but you will be able to hear it, not see it. And um, it is uh, uh, explanatory so that um, if you could see the... The first one is called Shadow of the Templars. It's narrated by Henry Lincoln, who's one of the authors of Holy Bread, Holy, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and the Messianic Legacy. And they also have done another research work on the, uh, I can't, the conspiracy to conceal the Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff like that. But this is Shadow of the Templars, and then the other one will be Secret of the Templars, also narrated by Henry Lincoln. Your second video has a seven-minute segment missing, so if there's a place in there where all of a sudden you're not quite sure what's going on, just hang with it. It'll, it'll catch you up as you go, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, it helps if you can see the video. Um, if you can't see the video, uh, it is uh, the narration is uh, extremely uh, detailed, and if you just close your eyes and listen to the narration, you'll be able to understand what's happening here. And uh, you will not be able to hear the entire uh, second uh, um, video. In fact, you, you may not even start it. But uh, pay close attention because you, you will have some revelations here that I don't think that you would have had otherwise. Because I screwed up when I was recording it. That's why it's missing. Yeah. Are you rolling tape, Dave, please? Where's the remote? But within their ranks, a secret was born, a secret still kept today. Find out more as we piece together a rose, a star, and a saint in a puzzle that is the shadow of the Templar. military order who fought for Christ in the 12th and 13th centuries, who died for Christ, and yet who at the last were accused of many crimes, of denying Christ, of trampling and spitting on the cross. Their story is inextricably entwined in the history of this place and of the mystery which broke into the 20th century across the plain at Rana Chateau. For me, the beginning was the story of a man who lies buried here in the French Pyrenean village of Rennes le Chateau. Here lies de Henri Saunier, priest of Rennes le Chateau, 1885 to 1917. Sometimes when I stand beside this grave, I feel the urge to reach down into the earth and shake those moldering bones back to life. For nearly ten years, he's led me a curious dance. I chased many a false lead led to many a deceptive conclusion, being blinded by ingenious smoke screens, by clues strewn by him and others before him to conceal one astonishing and simple truth. The Templars, warriors clad in their iron mail with cloak of white, emblazoned with a cross the color of blood. Warriors, yet monks, who had taken the monastic vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty, an immensely wealthy order, who yet were individually poor, owning nothing. One of their seals symbolizes their communal brotherhood, 
An order of fighting monks, sworn like other brotherhoods of knights, like the pilgrims, like the crusading noblemen, to wrest the Holy Land from the Muslim unbelievers, who, in the eyes of Christendom, were desecrating the places holy to Jesus, to the faith of Europe. The earliest mention of their name appears to be here in the Chronicle of William of Tyre, written in 1160. He tells us that the poor knights of Christ and the Temple of Solomon were founded in 1118 by Hugh of Pyons. Hugh, with eight companions, banded together with the idea that, as far as their strength permitted, they should keep the roads and highways of the Holy Land safe, with a special regard for the protection of pilgrims. Nine men undertaking the seemingly impossible task of policing the wild and perilous pathways of the desert. Only nine men to protect the thousands of pilgrims and crusaders swarming into Palestine in those uncertain and dangerous times. With this plan, they are told, they presented themselves to the King of Jerusalem. He seems to have found their objective a worthy one and placed at their disposal an entire wing of the royal palace, which stood on the foundations of the old temple. Hence the name Templos. Part of their home still stands. It is the women's wing of the al aqsa Mosque, here on the Temple Mount. Within a short space of time, the king vacated the palace entirely, leaving it in the control of the poor knights. For nine years, William tells us, the nine poor knights pursued their objectives, admitting no new members to their order. There is, however, a total silence on what their activities actually were during those nine years. Word of the ministry priest, the soldiers of Christ, spread back to Europe, and in 1128, the Templars were officially recognized as a religious military order. No secular authority, no ecclesiastical power would hold sway over them. They were a power unto themselves, autonomous owing allegiance to neither kings nor prelates, answerable only to the Pope himself. From strongholds outside Jerusalem, they strengthened their grip on the Holy Land. There was a certain glamour to these iron monks, enduring in the name of Christ the burning heat of the desert. In the two decades which followed, younger sons of noble families flocked to enroll in the Templars ranks. Vast donations in goods, money and land were made from every quarter of Christendom. And within 12 months of their incorporation, the order held huge estates all over Europe. And in 1147, the Templars embarked on the Second Crusade. The reputation they established in battle was one of zeal, tinged with an almost insane foolhardiness. Foolhardy they may have seen, but their rule forbade them to sue for ransom, or even to retreat unless the odds were more than three to one. Jerusalem was their home, stronghold of the armies of Christendom, and here the Templar knighthood flourished. influence of the Templars grew. Diplomatic links were even maintained with the Muslim world, to which they were yet so often opposed on the field of battle. But the Templars world was not confined to war and the intrigues of international diplomacy. In their early years here, they established markets and took commissions from which they financed their operations. With their network of castle protectories spread throughout Europe and the Near East, they were able to organize the safe transfer of money for merchant traders. Modern banking grew directly from the system instituted by these efficient and dedicated men. And they traded not only in money, but ideas. Their contacts with Islamic and Judaic culture made them a natural clearinghouse for new systems of thought, new philosophies, new sciences. Some people have even said that they brought the chess game into Europe. At the dawn of the 14th century, King Philippe le Bel sat on the throne of France. The Templars were firmly established with a network of castles throughout his kingdom. 
that the Templars owed him no allegiance. Their fidelity was reserved solely for the Pope. Philippe had no control over them, and he owed them money, sufficient cause to spur a medieval monarch to action. Heresy was the excuse. The king's first necessity was to ensure the cooperation of the Pope. Through ruthless pressure and intrigue, he engineered the election of the Archbishop of Bordeaux to the vacant papal throne in 1305. The newly elected Pope Clement V then moved the papal court to Avignon, committing the papacy to what is remembered as the Babylonian captivity, his 70 years in France. With the Pope in his pocket, Philippe exacted his payment for the gift of his influence, and that payment included the suppression of the Templars. At dawn on Friday the 13th of October 1307, the Templars throughout France were arrested. Although Philippe's objective of total surprise seems to have been achieved, his prime target, the Order of Wealth, was never found, and what became of the Templars' treasure has remained a mystery. In France, the Templars were tried, and many were put to the torture. Strange confessions and even stranger accusations were made. Grim rumors began to spread. The Templars worshipped the devil called Atomic. At their secret ceremonies, they prostrated themselves before a head which spoke to them and gave them some inexplicable power. Outsiders who chanced to witness their rights disappeared, never to be seen again. And they were accused of other things too. Of teaching women how to abort. Of sodomy. The most bizarre of all the charges to be leveled against these soldiers of Christ, who had fought and laid down their lives so valiantly in Christ's name and in his service. They were accused of denying Christ and trampling on the cross. Their treatment was without mercy. All were imprisoned, many were burned. And in the papal bull of 1312, the entire order was officially dissolved. But how did these knights, sworn to poverty, become the wealthiest and most powerful institution in Christendom? How did these dedicated soldiers of the faith come to incur the terrible charges of blasphemy and heresy which were leveled against them? Fascinating though these questions were, I began to ask myself if the mystery of the Templars was truly a part of my main task, the unravelling of the puzzle of the 19th century priest Berenger Saunière and his tiny village. I felt that the Templars had to be left to one side unless I could find something more tangible to link their presence here with the fabric of the local story. True, there were links, but were they important? Important to the story of Sonia, the penniless priest which I knew so well. The priest who began in poverty and yet spent millions who made a discovery in his church of the parchments which hid secret messages. One speaking of a treasure belonging to Dagobert and to Zion. And the other more complex, more cryptic. Shepherdess, no temptation to which Poussin Tenier hold the key. Peace 681. By the cross and this horse of God, I complete this demon guardian at midday. Blue apples. The message which led Saunier to the painting by Poussin of the supposedly imaginary tomb which yet exists in the countryside nearby. The obvious relevance of the painting led me to undertake a detailed examination of it, and I found what seemed to me to be a curious and rigid geometry. I sought the guidance of Professor Christopher Cornford of the Royal College of Art, who had made a special study of the geometry of paintings. He found a totally unexpected and quite startling underlying structure, and it was pentagonal. The pentagon is formed by overlapping regular triangles, whose angles are 36 degrees, 72 degrees and 72 degrees, a five-pointed star. Professor Cornford suggested 
that if Toussaint was saying anything, it was that pentagons and the angles of the pentagon were important. Perhaps I should look for them in association with Rennes Le Chateau. Remember now that first hint in the parchments that the treasure belongs to Dagobert and to Zion. Now Zion is Jerusalem, where the story of the Templars seems to begin. And Dagobert was one of the last kings of the Merovingian Franks. The Merovingians were not anointed kings, but kings by virtue of their blood, which was believed to have some magical, even divine, attribute or quality. They were called the long-haired kings, and like Samson, their power was supposedly vested in their hair, which they could never cut. According to legend, they were identified by a distinctive birthmark, a rose-red cross. most famous and influential king of the Merovingian dynasty was Clovis I, who led pagan Gaul to Christianity. When Clovis was baptized at Reims, he became king not only by virtue of his blood, but also by sanction of the Roman Church. But as so often happens, the rule of a strong king diminishes with his successors. When Dagobert II inherited the kingdom, attempts were made to keep him from his throne, and in the year 679, he was assassinated. His infant son, Sigebert, now rightful king, was reputed to have died with him. But a stone uncovered by Saunière supposedly depicts the rescue of that child, who was carried to safety to the ancestral home of his mother, and that home was Rennes le Chateau. Here, Sigebert grew to manhood, and through his descendants, the blood royal of the Merovingians flowed on in gnarled and numerous family trees, nursing an accumulation of bitterness and rancor stemming from the betrayal of Dagobert and the loss of their rightful inheritance, the throne of France. And at last, that blood bore fruit in the house of Lorraine. Godfrey of Boulogne, Count of Bouillon and Duke of Lorraine, was a direct lineal descendant of Dagobert II. And when, in 1090, Christendom mobilized to recapture the Holy Land and the sepulchre of Christ from the Islamic unbelievers, Godfrey was in command of the mightiest of the four armies which embarked on the Crusade. When Jerusalem fell to the Crusaders in 1099, a mysterious group of religious figures convened. The identity of this group has eluded the investigation of historians. Its task was to elect a king of Jerusalem. This shadowy but clearly influential group of electors promptly offered the crown to Godfrey of Bouillon. For the supporters of the blood royal of the Merovingians, Godfrey was already a rightful king, but a king without a kingdom. Now that mysterious conclave had given him the most precious kingdom on earth, the Holy Land. But could I begin to identify this shadowy but powerful organization? And could I find a connection, a link with the Order of Knights Templar? And then I found a document. It attests to the existence in 1090 of a mysterious organization called the Ordre de Notre Dame du Mont de Zion, the Order of Our Lady of the Mount of Zion, which apparently acted in close concert with Godfrey of Bouillon. The document also asserts that at least five of the nine founding Knights Templar were also members of this same Order of Zion. But how authentic is this document? History seems to make no reference to any order of Our Lady of Zion. At first glance, the document may well seem spurious. But the deeper one probes into the obscured recesses of history, the greater the weight of circumstantial evidence that emerges. <laughs> churches, an abbey was built. It is called the Abbey of Notre-Dame de Zion. 
It seems reasonable to suggest that those who occupied the new abbey were members of an order which bore that same name. But reasonable suggestion cannot prove the existence of the order. However, documents do exist, dating from the time of the Templars which are not speculative and cannot be disputed. One refers explicitly to the Abbot of Notre Dame de Dion, and another cites the order in an elaborate transfer of abbeys and church lands. It is clear then that we are not discussing some fictional organization, but one which had an actual and documented existence. But what would its objective? And why did it remain so carefully in the background? And what can be made of its links with the Knights Templar? Let us look again briefly at the early known history of the Templars, but now with this new knowledge held as a backdrop to the picture. The Priory's document insists that five of the nine founding Templars were members of Notre Dame de Zion, already established in Jerusalem for more than a decade. If I am right, Zion was the shadowy religious group behind the election of the King of Jerusalem. Perhaps I should look to the Church for a figure known to be associated with the Templars and who could provide the link. immediately emerges from the shadows. The dominant Christian voice of his age was Bernard of Clairvaux of the Cistercian Order. The Cistercian monks were the purely monastic, non-military equivalent of the fighting Templar monks. Bernard drew up the rule by which the Templars were to live. Could he also have been concerned with the mystery surrounding the Order of Zion and their hidden involvement in the founding of the Templars, their offspring order. It is clear that St. Bernard played a vital role in the early history of the Knights Templar. And curious hints of that role have been proposed by certain historians who have studied and interpreted his writings. One such hint relates to the time of the Templars' return to France after their early years in Jerusalem. The work has been accomplished with our help, and the knights have been sent under the protection of the Comte de Champagne, where all precautions can be taken against interference by public or ecclesiastical authority, where one can best make sure of a secret, a watch, a hiding place. No interference from public or ecclesiastical authority, and a search for a hiding place. Could the Templars have been sent to the Holy Land to bring something back from Jerusalem? Something which St. Bernard was privy to? Something which had to be protected, hidden away? Could this explain why the king vacated the palace and handed it over to the Knights Templar? And the silence of the records concerning their activities during those first nine years? We must remember that at the end of their history, the Templars kept inviolate the secrets of the whereabouts of their treasure. What precious thing might have been in their possession? So precious that not even torture could bring a hint of it from their lips. And where could have been the resting place of their secret? Their watch? Their hiding place? On Friday the 13th of October, 1307, we are told, King Philip succeeded in having all the Templars of France arrested. That statement, however, is not quite true. One group of Templars alone succeeded in escaping the clutches of Philip's executioners, and they were the Templars of this protectory of Bezu. How did they escape and why? The clue lies in the name of the commander here at the time of the Templars' downfall. It was the Seigneur de Gaulle. And the Pope, King Philippe's reluctant accomplice, was Clement V, who before taking that name on his election to the papal throne, was Bertrand de Gaulle. Bertrand de Gaulle, whose mother was Ida de Blanchefort, 
of that same family who gave the Templars their fourth Grand Master, and whose lands spread out from their ancestral home there across the plains. An earlier member of that Blanchefort family, Bertrand de Blanchefort, became in 1153 fourth Joint Grand Master of both Templars and Order of Zion. Bertrand could be seen to be the most significant of all the Grand Masters of the Temple. He it was who transformed the Order into the superbly efficient and highly organized institution it became. Thus, with their mysterious task accomplished in their early years, and under the influence of St. Bernard, the power of the Temple grew. By 1187, both the Templars and their parent order of Zion were well established. But by then, too, the Templars appear to have grown too powerful, too autonomous, too unwieldy and unmanageable for their parent organization. To the order of Zion, the Templar order may well have seemed a self-willed and unruly child. In 1187, the Grand Master of the Temple, Gerard de Riedefort, led his knights into a rash, impetuous, ill-conceived and disastrous battle outside Jerusalem, and the Holy City was lost. The documents of the Order of Zion refer to this action as treachery. And in the following year, 1188, the records refer to a separation between the two orders. The parent set the child free. And though family links remained, the Templars now stood on their own feet, free to ride with haughty arrogance through the remaining century and a quarter of their existence to their final grim doom in 1307. After the split, the parent order modified its name. Henceforth it was to be known as the Priory de Zion, the Priory of Zion. And as such, it has continued its cloaked and shadowy existence down the years. When I first saw this document, I was by no means inclined to regard it as authoritative, nor even reliable as evidence. Among the information it contains is a list of the names of the Priory of Zion's Grand Masters after their separation from the Templars and up to the present day. Victor Hugo, Jean Cocteau, Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton. Some of these names are so illustrious that the list seemed just the sort of grandiose pedigree that would be created for itself by a lunatic fringe body of eccentrics playing at secret societies. But it's all too easy to make assumptions and not to keep an open mind. Isaac Newton. One of the greatest scientists that England has produced. What could the priory embody that would attract him and the other great figures on the list? All seem to share some interest in the esoteric, the occult, in secret teachings, hidden knowledge, knowledge which at certain times in the past would have been heretical and highly dangerous. Leonardo da Vinci, great artist, great thinker, unorthodox in his religious beliefs. Jean Cocteau, great writer and artist, unorthodox in his religious beliefs. The common ground which all these men share, and they share much, was still not enough. Were the connections more than guesswork? Something was still missing. Something which binds these great men and claims their allegiance. Their allegiance and their silence. But we must not lose sight of the origins of our hunt. So near the obscure parish priest and a remote mountain hamlet. Here, in his church, he found the clues which led to his treasure. Could I perhaps find traces of the Priory of Zion here at the heart of the mystery? The parchments conceal the key word Zion. They bear also the initials P.S. This must refer not to Jerusalem, but to the Priory of Zion, which calls itself also the Ordre de la Rose Croix Veritas, the Order of the True Rose Cross. And Sonia's imagery in his church repeats again and again the rose on the cross, the emblem of the Rosicrucians, who burst upon the world in the 17th century in the Rosicrucian Manifestos written by Valentin Andrea, Grand Master of the Priory. The Rose Cross 
which seems to echo the rose-red cross emblem of the Templars, birthmark of the Merovingians. The story seems to stretch into a distant past through heresy and the Templars and murdered tombs. And my researchers have uncovered a priory document of genealogies, tracing the descent from the Merovingians and leading to a man called Pierre Pontard de Saint Clair, in whose veins it seems now ran the blood of the long forgotten Dagobert the Second. After some natural hesitation, he at last agreed to talk about his place in this story. Monsieur Pontard, is there still a secret at Rennes le Chateau? Mais le secret n'est pas seulement Rennes le Chateau. Il est aussi autour de Rennes. Will the treasure of Rennes le Chateau ever be found? Si vous me parlez d'un trésor matériel, nous ne parlons pas de trésor matériel. Disons simplement qu'il existe un secret à Rennes le Chateau. Il est possible qu'il existe autre chose autour de Rennes le Chateau. And how does Poussin fit into this story? Euh, effectivement, dans le tableau de Poussin, il y avait certaines révélations. Poussin est un initié. Il a donc construit son tableau en initié. Mais dans l'histoire, il n'y a pas plus d'autres personnages. Vous savez déjà une forme d'expression où la vérité se trouvait cachée à partir des symboles. Can you tell us whether the Priory of Zion still exists today? À l'heure actuelle, si on existe toujours, l'un des six derniers membres, l'un des six derniers grands maîtres, c'était Jean Cocteau. Tout le monde le sait. Monsieur Cantard, over the centuries you have, uh, uh, how shall I put it, uh, you have supported the Priory of Zion. Nous avons soutenu ce chien. Et si on nous a soutenu? We. Who are we? Oui, je parle de la lignée mérovingienne, car notre lignée est issue de Dagobert II. Les mérovingiens, ce sont eux qui ont créé la France. Sans eux, il n'y aurait pas de France. Les Capétiens, les Carolingiens, ils ont suivi la ligne des mérovingiens. Les mérovingiens représentent la France. Le roi perdu, the lost king, so strong and persistent a thread in French history and legend. But is this story really nothing more than an elaborate cloak of mystification to cover a futile attempt to restore a long-forgotten dynasty of French kings? Rennes le Chateau, where the son of the assassinated Saint Dagobert was brought. Blanchefort. Ancestral home of the fourth Grand Master of the Templars, Bertrand de Blanchefort. And Bezu, the preceptory which evaded the net when the Templars fell in 1307. Bezu, Blanchefort, Rennes le Chateau. Three castles locked together in a precise geometric relationship. Echoed in the 17th century by Nicolas Poussin in his masterpiece Les Berger d'Arcadie. A picture in which Sonia took a great interest. But is there any reason to suppose that Poussin was involved in a secret other than merely the oddity of having apparently painted a landscape which the experts tell us he never saw? Well, in April 1656, Poussin had a conversation with a French priest. The priest wrote to his brother about that conversation, and historians have long been aware of that letter which speaks of a secret that Poussin had, which kings would have pains to draw from him. Poussin most certainly had a secret, and I was convinced it lay in the Pythagorean pentagonal geometry with which he structured his painting of the tomb at Arc. But where were all these fragments of information taking me? Some unquestionably locked together. Some were obviously part of the puzzle, but their place in it was unclear. Yet another element was needed, a connecting thread, and that still eluded me. We'll return to ancient mysteries in a moment. Here on A.
broadcast. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. Voice of Freedom, you have been listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network.